You know, we're going to be talking about forgiveness. The forgiveness that we have in Christ frees us in two main ways. Um, it frees us from the guilt of our own sin, right? And the guilt of your own sin can be debilitating. I mean, if you think about the sins that you have committed and you dwell upon them and you are overwhelmed and drowning in the guilt of your past sins, that can affect your life. It can affect your mental state. Uh, just dwelling upon your sins and the guilt that goes along with it. Number two, there's another thing that can uh, greatly affect your life, and that is your bitterness or animosity towards others who have sinned against you. Uh, somehow, maybe in your past or your childhood, you've been violated, and uh, that uh, has affected your mental state, that have, has affected your outlook on life. The forgiveness that we have in Christ changes both of those things. It completely eliminates any need for us to be guilty or to feel guilty for our past sins because it's all under the blood of Christ. Christ has afforded us a pardon. A pardon means that you can never be tried for those sins again. Those sins are gone. We, there's no guilt left. Also, because Christ has forgiven us, uh, God has forgiven us, and Christ has died on the cross for us, and uh, he bore our sins, uh, and he's forgiven us by his grace, no merit of our own. He then says, because I've forgiven you this way, by my grace and by my mercy, no merit of your own, then you ought to forgive others. See? Uh, so his death on the cross for us and his forgiveness affords us a freedom from both of those things, from the guilt for our own sin and also any bitterness that we may be harboring towards those who have sinned against us. There's no reason for a man or a woman to be walking through life in guilt of their own sin or bitterness or resentment uh, toward those who have sinned against them. Now, the freedom in Christ allows us liberty from both of those things. And we'll talk about that a little bit more detail as we go on. Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26. says, And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and left him, let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll bless the preaching of your word. Help us to appreciate your forgiveness. Help us to understand how we have to deal with our sins, past, present, and future. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll bless the preaching of your word. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. We've already seen Christ's authority starting many chapters ago when Christ started his ministry. We saw his authority over the truth. That is, he was the one who could speak the truth. Uh, he is the one who had right, biblical, godly doctrine. We saw his authority over truth. We saw his authority over the devil when he went into the wilderness and he was tempted. And each time the devil tempted him, he answered back with scripture. And he proved his power over Satan. We saw his power over disease. The last time we saw the healing of the leper. And we saw that Christ has healing over disease. Later on, and along with that, you can say that Christ has authority over creation, as we are his creation. In chapter 8, you see his authority over the sea, as he says, peace be still, and he makes it calm. Uh, Luke is, is doing, uh, that's what he's doing here. He's giving a story after story after story of Christ's ministry, showing Christ's authority. And this is no different. He shows us Christ's authority over sin. Well, here in our passage, you find that Christ comes, he's teaching, he's in a house, it must have been quite a large house, there was a large crowd there, in fact there was an overflow crowd to the point where nobody could get near Jesus Christ, we've already seen the crowds in, in past messages, the multitude that would come and press upon him, uh, so he's in a house, there's an overflow crowd, and there's some people there who have come to hear him, well they've come, but they haven't come to hear him, 
the Pharisees, it says, and the doctors of the law. They've come. And the Bible says they've come from multiple cities. They come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was there present to heal them. So why have these Pharisees and these doctors of the law come to sit and to hear Jesus? Not to learn. I think about Paul when he talked about those who have came, come to spy out the liberty that they had. That is, they came just to, uh, with a cynical eye, watch and listen and try to find an occasion to accuse. And that's what these have done the Pharisees and the doctors of the law. The Pharisees were a sect of Judaism. Uh, these were the middle class uh, uh, Jews of leaders. Uh, they had great influence with the common people. Uh, there was also the Sadducees, and they were the upper class. They were the rich Jews. And uh, uh, But here it says the Pharisees were there. The Pharisees were proud. They were self-righteous. They eventually abandoned true religion for their own um, customs and their own traditions. And there they are. And they're there hearing Christ, waiting for him to say something so that they could accuse him. Christ saved his harshest words for these Jewish leaders, for the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, 23, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! And he goes on to say that they, they, they were so careful to observe the law that they tithed, they gave 10% of even their spices. You could picture them, you know, with their spices. And they have it all laid out and they're separating exactly 10% of these spices to give in order to keep the letter of the law. But it says that they've left undone the weightier matters like judgment and mercy and faith. Uh, so they were sure to keep the law, uh, but they did not have the inward uh, uh, desire or the inward heart to really please God and to worship him in spirit and truth. And then you have the doctors of the law that were there, the scribes, the lawyers. These were people who gave their lives to studying the law uh, to understand it and to know how to apply it. So they're there. They're not there with the right attitude. But there's many who were there to hear Christ. And for that reason, uh, there was a great crowd uh, that kept others who wanted to hear Christ from being able to get near him. And uh, that's exactly what we find here. It says in verse 18, Behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. The palsy means he is paralyzed. I don't know how. Obviously, he could not walk. He may have been paralyzed from the neck down. I don't know. Uh, but he was paralyzed, uh, so much so that he needed four men. Mark tells us there's four men carrying him in a bed to hear Jesus and to be healed of him. So they come. Uh, he has convinced his friends. I don't know if his friends, I don't think his friends needed convincing because later on the Bible says that Christ saw their faith, plural. Uh, so he saw the faith of the man with the palsy and he saw the faith of these four men. You see, this is different than today. Today, your friend's faith can't save you, right? That's absolutely true. Your friend's faith. I'm looking at this thinking, well, it had to be the man's faith, not the faith of these four men that carried him. But I thought about, what do you do when Christ raises somebody from the dead? Whose faith <laughs> did Christ, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's an occasion where there's a woman uh, with, his, with her son who has passed away, and the Bible says that Christ had compassion on the mother and then raised up the son. Well, here, Christ sees the faith of the man with the, par with the paralysis, and he sees the faith of the men that are carrying there him, and as we're going to see, he's going to be healed. hope I didn't break any, any suspense there for you, but he's going to be healed. Uh, Christ sees their faith. So, uh, here's these four men. They're carrying their friend to Jesus. They get there, and they're excited because Christ is going to heal their friend. Uh, at least they're going to ask him. They have faith that he can. But they get, and there's a huge crowd. You ever go to Disney World? Your kids are all excited. Hey. Uh, we're excited. We're going to go on these rides, and you get there, and there's an hour wait to get on these things. They have those signs up from this point. It's a one-hour wait. From this point, it's an hour and a half wait, and uh, you're thinking, we paid this money to get here, so let's get in line, right? Uh, here they are. They're excited to see Christ, and uh, there's no way. What do you do? I don't know how long these folks traveled, but I know it had to be quite straining on them, these four men carrying their friend. Uh, here they are. They've come. There's no way to get in. So what do they do? All right, we'll turn around, we'll go home, maybe we'll find another time to be able to meet Christ. It's not what happened. The Bible says that as they saw there was no way to get in, they went up upon the housetop. This is no small task. It's not just the four men going on the housetop, it's the four men with the paralyzed man going up on the housetop. I don't know how they did it. Uh, there would have been stairs on the side of the house, uh, so they would have went up that way, I guess. Uh, it would have been not an easy task if you ever gone and tried to help somebody move, uh, right? And uh, they got all their furniture, and then you get there and you say, you live on the second level? 
You got to go up that second level with the couch, right? And you say, oh, maybe you want to buy a new couch, right? Uh, somebody else will deliver it for you. Uh, well, that's what's happening here. Here they are. There's no way. Maybe the guy with the paralysis says, the roof. Let's go on the roof. The four guys thinking to themselves, the roof. Yeah, okay, I guess we can do that. What do we do once we get on the roof? Well, the Bible tells us what they did. There they are. They went up on the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch. Now, this house did not just happen to have a gaping hole in the roof. Okay? They went up on the housetop. They got the man, the man on the stretcher sitting on the house. The four men are on the top of the house. Christ is in the bottom. He's teaching. There's crowds all around him. The only way to get this man down is to start tearing up the roof. And that's what they did. And there's tiling. There would have been beams that went across. And there would have been... Um, tiles, they're very likely that there was earth on top of there. You talk, you know, now you see these green roofs, people growing grass on the top of the roofs. That's not new. Uh, there's probably grass up there. There would have been soil uh, on top of the tile and things like that. So they start, it's a mini excavation. They start digging uh, through this. There's dirt all over the place. They start pulling up the sticks and the twigs and the tile. And uh, imagine Christ there teaching in this house. And all of a sudden, little drops of soil coming down, right? And you see, everybody's trying to listen to Christ, but they're looking and something's happening. All of a sudden, you see some sunlight peers through the roof. People don't know what's happening. Christ continues to teach, and they're watching, and all of a sudden, the hole's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I know that sometimes when I'm teaching and there's an interruption, I just can't keep teaching. i got to stop, right? I just can't. I don't like competition when I'm teaching. So uh, Christ, all, there would have come the point where everybody's eyes would have been on the ceiling, and Christ would have stopped what he was saying and all the eyes turned to the ceiling and here's the sunlight and the hole gets bigger and bigger and you see these four heads peering down <laughs> but that's not the strangest part the four heads peer down and they see christ and then they take the man on the stretcher and i don't know how they did it they obviously had some rope up there but they lowered the entire bed down in front of jesus christ right they lowered the entire bed down in front of jesus christ in the midst of this huge crowd and the Bible says there that uh, Christ sees these four men. He sees the bed come down. The Bible calls it a couch. Uh, the couch in the midst before Jesus. I mean, good aim too, right? I mean, they're able to take that ceiling off, take that roof off and to lower them down. It says right before Jesus. They got his attention, didn't they? And the amazing thing too, they're, they're lowering a man, Okay. Think about this man with the paralysis. I mean, he's the one laying on the bed. He's the spectacle being lowered down in the midst of this crowd right in front of Jesus. Like what? Hi, Jesus. <laughs> right? uh, it's just amazing. I think it's amazing. You guys are obviously aren't as entertained with the story as I am, but uh, I can see it. Here's this man in the midst of Jesus. Uh, you know, the four guys are still up on the ceiling or on the roof, and here he is in the midst of this crowd right before Christ. And it says, when he saw their faith, plural, when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees actually say something that's true here. They began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Not that Christ was blaspheming, but he says, Who can forgive sins but God alone? They understood that only God could forgive sins because only God could forgive sins. Christ either was blaspheming or he was God. But they weren't willing to make that leap and say he was God, so they settled on the fact that he was blaspheming. Uh, but he was not blaspheming. They were absolutely right. Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus was God, and Jesus forgave this man his sins. Why is it that only God can forgive sin? Because the very nature of sin, the reason why sin is sin, is because it's a violation of God's, Character is a violation of God's holiness. He is the only one who has been offended by your sin. Now, there's repercussions of your sin that affect other people, but the only one who can forgive is the only one who has been offended, which is God the Father. If somebody offends you, your friend can't go and offer forgiveness to the one who has offended you. You're the only one. You have the power to withhold or to offer forgiveness. And it's God and God alone who can forgive sin because sin at his very core is a violation of his holiness and his righteousness. Now, can we all admit that we're all sinners? Say, so, well, I'm a Christian. You're still a sinner. You're a saved sinner. You're a pardoned sinner. 
but you still remain a sinner. Why is sin so awful? Because it's an offense to a holy God, right? David, when he had committed his sin with Bathsheba in Psalm chapter 51, he says, against thee, the only, have I sinned. Against thee, the only, have I sinned. Well, wait a second, David. What about Bathsheba? What about Bathsheba's husband that you had murdered? What about the child that Bathsheba is now going to lose? What about Bathsheba's father? If you know the story, who ends up and seeks vengeance upon David? What do you mean you've only sinned against God? Whenever we sin, God is the sole offendee. He's the only one who's offended, though there may be repercussions that affect other people. So sin, uh, if it's to be forgiven, must be forgiven by God and God alone. The Bible says in Habakkuk 1.13 of God, it says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. That's God's character. He cannot even look upon evil, iniquity, or sin. Psalm 5.4 says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Which is a problem for us. Because heaven is God's dwelling place. And the Bible says there can be no sin dwelling with him. Our sin, the sin of this man, the sin of every man, you know what it does is it cuts us off from the life of God. It alienates us from the life of God, according to Ephesians 4.18. It says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life which was in God. Our sin alienates us from God's life. Our sin uh, renders us dead in trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians chapter 2. Romans 6 tells us that the wages or the penalty of sin is death. Romans, uh, that's Romans 6. John 3.36 tells us that if our sins go unforgiven, the wrath of God abides on us. Sin is a serious matter. It offends God. It incurs God's wrath. It renders us spiritually dead. But when you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you are made free from sin in Romans 6.22 and become the servants of God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end to everlasting life. So as whereas sin alienates us from the life of God, faith in Jesus Christ then results in everlasting life. Though our sin renders us dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.5, that upon faith we are quickened together or made alive together with Christ. And though our sin incurs the wrath of God, the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Being in a state of unconfessed, unforgiven sin is a serious matter. You are alienated from the life of God. Not only alienated from the life, but his wrath is abiding upon you. Uh, that is, you can do no good, you can do nothing to please him, but his wrath is abiding on you, and the day will come where you will experience his wrath for all of eternity. But there's good news. The good news is the same God who is offended by sin, the same God who will pour out his wrath upon all sin, the same God who will not allow any sin to go unjudged is the God of love, the God of mercy, the God of grace, and the God of forgiveness. God is willing and desiring to forgive us of all of our sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then it says, being justified, speaking to Christians being justified freely by his grace. Say, so God, just freely, by his grace. It all rests in him. It's his desire. It's his will, who by his grace pours out forgiveness, okay? But being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because Christ has come and died, he's borne the wrath of God. He's been buried. He's been quickened by the Spirit. He's now alive. His sacrificial death on the cross now has paid the price for our sin. So now God, in answer to that, freely by his grace offers forgiveness. You see that again in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Saying because Christ has died, 
Because he has purchased us on the cross, because he has redeemed us, we now have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, it's very important that you realize forgiveness comes by the grace of God. And we'll see why in just a moment. 1 John 2.12, John says he writes to his audience why. He says, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Colossians 2.13 tells us in you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Whereas sin renders us spiritually dead, alienated from his life, to the place where we're going to incur God's wrath, salvation then results in life and it results in forgiveness. So question, if you're a Christian here this morning, your sins are forgiven. Your trespasses are all forgiven. Your iniquity, however you want to say it, your violation of God's character, the offenses that you have stocked up against God, every single sin has been forgiven. The Christian has no right, the Christian has no reason to dwell on past sins before salvation. A Christian has no reason to allow their sins before salvation to depress them, to bring them down, to cause them to feel guilty. The Bible says all has been forgiven. That strikes to the very character of God. God is a forgiving God. Exodus 34, 6, when the Lord passes before Moses and declares his name, he says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That's God's character. He says, this is who I am. That was his character in the Old Testament. The New Testament is unchanging. He's forgiving. Psalm 65, 3 says, Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Psalm 86, 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Now, some people think that God is there and he's always on the verge of judgment. He's always standing ready to condemn you. But you know what this verse says? It says he's ready to forgive. It means that he's always standing ready to forgive. He's always waiting for one to come in faith so that he can forgive. Yes, there's wrath and there's judgment. But you know what? The Bible says he's withholding his judgment. He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is what? He's long-suffering toward us. He's withholding his judgment because he's ready to forgive. He wants to forgive. If you will come in faith, don't ever get the impression that Christianity is for good people. Christianity is for bad people. In fact, until you acknowledge that you are a bad person, you can't be saved. Until you acknowledge that you are a sinner, you can't be saved. Until you acknowledge that your sin has violated God's holiness, you can't be saved. Salvation is for bad people. So once you get saved, you don't put a tie on, and put a skirt on, and then pretend like you got it all together. You say, I'm still a bad person, but I've been redeemed. I'm still a bad person, but I've been forgiven. I'm still a bad person, but God has given me his spirit, and now he has enabled me to live for him, all by his grace. Psalm 103, verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. So some people say the Old Testament law, New Testament grace. Yeah, that's true. Some people go too far and say, Well, the Old Testament, God reveals himself in the Old Testament as a judge of sin. Right? He's just the judge. He's the angry God in the Old Testament. No. God's character is consistent all throughout Scripture. He's merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Listen, if God really was a God of judgment and wrath, and that was his chief characteristic, we would not be here today. Like when Adam sinned and Eve sinned, they would have been destroyed off the face of the earth and mankind would never have been allowed to continue. But God is a loving God. He's a merciful God. And he's allowed for man to continue so that his mercy could be magnified and his forgiveness 
could be magnified. Psalm 133 says, If thou, Lord, shalt us mark our iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? That is, if he would to go to that place where he just marks or he points out or he judges every iniquity, nobody would be able to stand before him. The only reason we can is because there is forgiveness with thee, it says, that thou mayest be feared. Micah 7.18 Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Listen, God doesn't get any joy from the death of the wicked, but what he does get joy from is showing mercy. There's nobody who has come to God and legitimately thought to themselves, I'm too wicked to be saved. I'm too much of a sinner to be saved. I have done too much to mess up my life to be saved. If somebody's thinking that way, they do not understand salvation. Now, what do you do if you've already been saved and you have that sin in your life? We'll get to that in just a second. God's character is such that he delights in mercy. He delights in forgiveness. He gives abundant pardon. Uh, that is his nature. That's his very character. He's a loving, merciful, forgiving God. And you know what that character has led him to do? It's led him to make a covenant. To make a covenant. Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-three says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will, will be their God and they shall be my people. Now this is a covenant to Israel which will be f fulfilled eventually. Uh, when they uh, crucified the Messiah, rejected Jesus Christ, God turned to the Gentiles and now he's offered this covenant to the Gentiles, to us. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. How could God make that covenant? Because he knew that he was going to send his son to die on the cross to pay for our sin. And he says, I will forgive their iniquity, will remember their sin no more. That's a covenant. He says it's a covenant. God's covenants are only as good as his character. And because he is an unchanging and he's faithful, he's a covenant-keeping God, because he's merciful and gracious and forgiving, we can trust this covenant. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 7 that God is faithful and he keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. We need to go quickly here, so I'm going to skip over some things. Deuteronomy 23, 19 simply says, God is a man. And God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Saying, if God made a covenant to forgive iniquity and to forgive sin, he will do it. And that's the covenant that we have entered into upon salvation. So when God makes a covenant, he binds himself to the fulfillment of that covenant. I so said, why are we talking about covenants? It's going to be very important for you to understand your forgiveness. When God makes a covenant, he binds himself to the fulfillment of that covenant. It's not like you and I. Hey, listen, and we do this in every relationship in life. This is how we understand life. If I do something good, then I get a good response. If I do something bad, I may get a bad response. If I treat my wife good, I expect her to treat me uh, good in return. If I uh, serve my boss well, I expect a paycheck. That's how we go through life. That is not the type of covenant that God has made with us. He doesn't say, if you do this, then I will forgive. Uh, if you hold up your end of the covenant, I will hold up my end of the covenant. That's not how God operates. What he has done is he has committed his own character for his own glory in this covenant. And he said, I will forgive your iniquity. And now it strikes to the very core of his character and his glory to fulfill the covenant. So what if we disobey? God's not going to allow your disobedience to rob him of glory. What if you sin? God's not going to allow your sin to rob him of of glory. It's not going to happen. And we see that in Psalm 89. God makes a covenant with David. And I want you to listen very carefully to this passage. Verse 24. It says, But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Horn simply means power or authority. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. 
He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, now listen, speaking about David and David's descendants, ultimately we're beneficiaries of this covenant as well through salvation. But if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, and you expect to hear all bets are off, right? The covenant's broken. Forget about it all. You expect it. That's how we would operate. That's not how God operates. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. You know what he's talking about? That's the language of a father disciplining a child. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Why? Next verse. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn, or once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. What he is saying is, it's not about David's obedience. It's not about his children's obedience. What, is it, what it is about is the covenant that I have made. And he says, I am not going to break my covenant. When I utter something out of my lips, I'm not going to alter it. It's God's faithfulness. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. He said, I have sworn. I've committed myself to this covenant. I am not going to be seen to be a liar. Isaiah 48, 9. He says, for my name's sake will I defer mine anger. For my name's sake. His name. Not even your good, but his name. For my name's sake shall I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. Even for mine own sake will I do it. How should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Listen. You were forgiven of your sins the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. God has guaranteed it. God has promised it. It is a covenant that he has made. And he says, I am never going to take that covenant away. I am never going to break that covenant. I'm never going to remember those sins again. Why? Because you're so good? No. He's going to do it for his own sake. He's going to do it for his own glory. He's not going to allow his name to be polluted. He's not going to allow anybody to see a believer in Jesus Christ fall out of the faith because that's going to strike to his very glory and his very character. So our forgiveness rests in God's unchanging character and his unchanging covenant. Anybody who believes you can lose your salvation doesn't know scripture. Anybody who says you can lose your salvation doesn't know the character of God. Anybody who says you can lose your salvation doesn't understand God's character when it comes to his covenants. They have not studied the word of God. If it's God's character and if it's his glory that offered the forgiveness, it's his glory, it's his character, it's his covenant that keeps us in salvation. And nothing can change that. Now, that's introduction. Let's get to our, let's get to our three points. How do you deal with your sins? And We're going to go quickly, okay? How do you deal with your sins in light of all of that? What should your view of your sins be? How about your past sins? What do you do with your past sins? You're a believer. Your sins have been covered. They have been forgiven. God has promised that those are never going to be remembered again. What do you do with those past sins? I might surprise you by saying, you know, as a Christian, you know what you got to do with those past sins? Remember them. Remember them. Why would you want to remember those sins? Well, uh, Paul, when he's talking to the Corinthians, he, dre he dredged up some old sin to remind them of. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, And such were some of you. 
But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He lists all these terrible sins and he says, oh, by the way, some of you were that. Do you know why he would bring that up? So then when he said, but ye are washed, makes that washing that much more, um, makes somebody rejoice in that washing so much more, doesn't it? But ye are sanctified, that ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at what you were so that you can rejoice in what you are. Remember what you were. Remember what you came from. But the key is this. Don't wallow in it. Don't look at your past sin and say, oh, I can't believe the life that I lived. I'm not worth anything. You're not worth anything then. You're not worth anything now. The only value you have is given to you by virtue of Christ's purchase of you on the cross. It has nothing to do with your past sins. It has nothing to do with your self-worth. It has to do with Christ's purchase of you. And that's where your value comes from. So don't go around life saying, uh, I can't believe what I have gone through. I can't believe what I have done. Listen. Yeah, that's what you used to be. Remember it. And then rejoice in the fact that Christ has purchased you, he has bought you, and he has forgiven you. So remember, but don't wallow. Remember, but don't relive. Many Christians, in the time of weakness, they start cycling through in their mind their past life. And they may not sin again, but they enjoy it vicariously by just thinking through uh, what they have done in the past. The Bible says in Romans 6.21, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? That will bring us shame to think of those things. Yeah, uh, we're ashamed of the life we used to live, but we know we've been forgiven. And that's what makes his, forgiving, his forgiveness so wonderful. Ephesians 5.11 says, 5.12 says, It's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them, sinners in secret. And it's a shame even to bring up your past life and to talk about it like, well, you know what I used to do. We're ashamed of those things. Sure, we remember them so that we can rejoice. We remember them, but we don't wallow in them. We remember them, but we don't relive them. Understanding that Christ has forgiven us. Well, you know what? We're going to real quickly look at Luke 7. I'm not going to get to uh, how to deal with our present sins and how to deal with our future sins. We're going to do that tonight. But I'm going to finish this point and we'll be done. How to deal with our past sins. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. It says, And one of the Pharisees, we already learned about the Pharisees, here's another one. One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner. Very likely this woman was a prostitute. Behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and had wiped them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. This Pharisee didn't get it. Jesus said they didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. What he's saying is not that there were any righteous on earth, but those who believed they were righteous could not come. Uh, those who admitted their sin are the ones who could come. Here's a woman who comes. She's a prostitute. Is there any sin in life that could be so devastating of mind, emotion, soul, body, self-worth, reputation, that being a prostitute? Well, here she was. She's a prostitute. She comes to Jesus Christ. She's got her hair down. The Bible says that a woman's hair is her glory. Here she is. She's wiping his feet with her hair, kissing his feet, wiping them with her hair, taking probably the most valuable thing she has, the alabaster box of ointment, putting it on him. Here's the Pharisee. He doesn't get it. He sees her unworthiness and says she's not worthy to be in here. Jesus says in his heart, the Pharisee is not worthy to be in here. The woman's not worthy to be in here. Nobody's worthy to be in here. But because she admits her unworthiness, that's what brings her to the place of salvation. And then in verse 44, it says, And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. 
My head with oil, that's just not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto, unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. You think the woman had peace when she came into the house? I think she was a wreck. I think she was weeping before she got there. I think she probably seen these people being healed physically to the point where men are willing to go on top of a roof and take the roof off and to lower somebody in on their bed. I think that she saw that and she thought, well, I can have that forgiveness too. She grabbed her alabaster box. She comes, she anoints Jesus. She washes with the feet. She's weeping. Now, she wasn't saved. Jesus says that she's loved because of what she had done. That was just the evidence of her faith. Thy faith hath saved thee. But I want you to hone in on three words there. It says in verse 50, he said unto the woman, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. Oftentimes a woman who lives a life like this, it's maybe very likely that she experienced something in her childhood, whether she was abused in her childhood or she was exposed to this type, type of stuff in her childhood, something that so damaged her that it led her to this lifestyle. I don't think this woman has had much peace in her life, uh, maybe from her childhood up. She hasn't had much peace. She's lived a life of turmoil. The Bible says there's no peace to the wicked. And uh, she, she lived a life of turmoil, a life of guilt, a life of unworthiness, a life of selfless, or a life of, uh, of low self-worth. But she comes to Jesus Christ. She believes in Christ. Christ forgives her. And you know what that forgiveness affords her? Peace. He says, leave. Leave in the full assurance that you are forgiven. Leave in the full assurance that everything that has happened in your life to this moment is forgiven. There's no reason to continue your life in guilt. There's no reason to continue with remorse. No reason even to continue in resentment for maybe what has happened to her in the past. He says, now you have peace. And she went and she did have peace. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The burden that this woman bore, I mean, this weight upon her shoulders, this lifestyle that she was living, that she might have partaken in the night before she comes to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you can come to me with that burden and you can unload it on me. You can take it off your shoulders and put it on my shoulders. And he does that. And he took this load off of this woman and says, now you go in peace, you go rest. Far be it from us then to leave having received Christ as our Lord and Savior. Him saying, I'm going to take this burden. And then through life, we keep trying to take that burden and put it back on our shoulders. He says, no, you're forgiven. Have peace. Isaiah 38, 17 says of God that he has cast all of our sins behind his back. Right? You take something and you just throw it behind your back. Hey, this is in the past. The Bible says that he's erased our sins. And Isaiah 43.25 I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. He said, I erased them for my sake. And if I have erased them, I'm not going to remember them anymore. If he's not going to remember them, why are you going to remember them? The Bible says in Micah 7.19, he says, He will turn again and he will com have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Corey Ten Boom may be familiar with. She's the one who hid many Jews during Hitler's occupation. And uh, she's a Christian. She said this, speaking of that verse where it says that God will cast all of our sins in the depths of the sea. She said, when I confess them to the Father, Jesus Christ washed them in his blood. They are now cast into the deepest sea and a sign is put up that says, no Fishing allowed. Don't fish out your old sins. Don't fish them out to wallow in them. Don't fish them out to relive them. Recognize that God has forgiven you. The weight is gone. He says, go in peace. And you can live in that peace. And what we're going to see tonight, I wish we had time to do it this morning, we don't. What we're going to see tonight is even within your salvation, 
say, yeah, I know. And Christians make this distinction, and they shouldn't do it. We say, I know all those sins are forgiven. I'm clean and I'm pure from everything before salvation. But now that I'm a Christian, I've really messed up. How can I live now for him? How can I look at another Christian? How can I pretend that I am a Christian now, seeing how I've really messed up since my salvation? The same God who is waiting to forgive in his mercy and grace before your salvation still stands ready to forgive. You weren't worthy to be saved. You're not worthy to keep your salvation. And you know why he's going to do it? For his own glory. He's going to bring you to the place where his covenant is absolutely fulfilled, even in the face of your disobedience. God is able to take a disobedient people and to make them into the image of Jesus Christ, and that's his covenant. But he's only able to do it if you're willing to accept the forgiveness that he's offering. The forgiveness is there. The only reason you the guilt is not gone is because you haven't availed yourself to it. You thought to yourself, I can't go back to God. I can't go back again and again and again and again asking him forgiveness. Why? Why not? You think it's your worthiness that ever got you any forgiveness? You sin and you sin again and you sin again and you sin again and you get to the point and say, I'm not even going to bother coming to God asking forgiveness. That's a silly thing to do. It's not scriptural. It's not biblical. That You don't have the right view of God. You don't have the right view of salvation. You don't have the right view of forgiveness. God is ready and willing to forgive. Peter comes to Jesus Christ, and we'll end with this. He says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Right? After the eighth time, I don't have to forgive? Jesus says to Peter, I say unto thee, until seven times, but until, not until seven times, but until seventy times seven. He's not saying, forgive your brother 490 times. He's saying, forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. Your brother comes back and does the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, but with sincerity asks for forgiveness. He says, you must forgive. Now, if Christ says that to Peter about his forgiveness of his brother, you think he's asking us to do something that God doesn't do? If that's what Peter was told to do with his brother, how much more is God willing to forgive us when we come to him, even for the same offense, over and over and over and over and over again. You say, I'm not worthy. You're right. But as you continually come, what is magnified? Not your worthiness. His mercy. His forgiveness. His covenant-keeping nature. God gets the glory. He doesn't get any glory from you wallowing in your sin and you being under the burden of your guilt. That doesn't glorify him. Avail yourself to his forgiveness. Recognize what you were before salvation. Rejoice that you are forgiven. But also after salvation, recognize he's always willing, standing, ready to give mercy. There's no reason to be standing under the weight of sin, whether before salvation or after salvation, or uh, looking at your past sins or your present sins. And we'll get to that a little bit more tonight. Let's go ahead and pray.